What's up, folks? I am Jamie Bettingfield. You are listening to my podcast, Too Many Words. Welcome to the show. Thanks for tuning your device my way. If you aren't already, you can subscribe to the show on iTunes so you won't miss an episode and follow on Stitcher for the same results. You can also go to patreon.com slash too many words and pledge your support to the show Gain some extra goodies, which includes getting to listen to the weekly episodes earlier than everyone else. How's it going? What's new? What's cooking on your side? Projects blooming, edit mountains, lots of walks, eating cupcakes while repeating what the hell happens next. Um, Yeah, that was me last Wednesday. But uh, yeah, things on my end are rolling on. I'm, I'm at the point where I'm starting to finish a lot of things that I've been juggling for a while. Turned 31 on Monday. Pajamas and fried chicken. Perfect for a rainy Monday. I miss warmth. February in Seattle. I am always damp and I uh, keep wearing my coat and scarf in the house. But yeah, things are quick pace, overflowing plates. Look good. I'm seeing progress and that makes me happy. My body, my words is due out March 1st. It's a collection of powerful essays that explores body image from so many beautiful talented voices it's edited by lauren Kleiman and amy archer and i'm honored to have my essay the scars that make me included in such wonderful company and bustle named the collection a feminist book that can change your year so that's pretty cool i'm excited about it Speaking of excited, I am really, really stoked to share the show this week. I have the absolute pleasure of talking to Delilah S. Dawson. She is one of my favorite authors to read. I read Servants of the Storm by her, I believe, in 2014. It instantly became a favorite, and she's been a go-to for me since. So if you aren't reading her books, you should start reading. And uh, after these notes, I'll be talking to her. Your, your two releases that came out in the fall, Phasma and Malice of Crows, have been, uh, I read them back to back. It was super fun. But that sounds like a very brutal week for you. <laughs> brutal fiction's my favorite kind, so it, <laughs> it works out. I, I can always tell I'm reading a shadow book when all get out just slips you know, out in, in random conversation, I'll be talking to like a random parent at school and I'll be like, no, it was crazier than all get out. And I'll be like, what? Yeah, I get I get into like when I'm writing those books, I like hitch up my jeans and kind of swagger around and like y'all are dumb as possums. Oh, <laughs> well, the narrative though is just so awesome. Oh, thank you so much. I uh, just turned in book four. So that's the, the fourth and final book in the Shadow series. So Trees and Hawks. Next year, we'll hopefully, um, you know, rip out some hearts, the usual. <laughs> oh, man. what That must have been intense right in the final of, of that series. It was, but I've kind of um, known for a while which way it was headed. We've sketched out the series from, um, they originally bought two, and then later on they bought two more. And so I, I kind of always knew how it was going to, to go down. Well, that helps. <laughs> Vision always helps. Visions of death and dismemberment. <laughs> yeah. Well, as far as like complex characters go... You really don't get more complex than Rhett. Oh, I love Rhett. Rhett's so much fun to write. Rhett's, Rhett's one of the easiest characters <laughs> that I write. Cause, like anytime you don't know what to do, he just punches somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering how it, how it was writing Rhett. No, he, um, you know, most books, like I, I teach writing online at Lit Reactor and at conferences and things. And I always tell people like, here's what to do or not do in your first chapter. And most importantly, no, it's probably going to change. Like your first chapter is rarely the same from when you write it, to when you edit it, to when you give it to an agent or an editor, like it changes all the time. Like Rhett's never changes. Like he's so secure on the page. It's like, that's where he starts. That's what he says. And then he just like, I'm not going to say he writes himself, but he does insist upon himself. That's so cool. Yeah. You know, I was wondering how it was, you know, cause I was thinking it was like, he could be really challenging to write because he's um, just, so complicated and quick triggered. But at the same time, I was like, well, I wonder if he's, he's, you know, easier to write because, you know, his reactions are just so set in stone. <laughs> yeah, he definitely doesn't whipple waffle. It's, you know, there are some characters where you come to a kind of like a branching path in a book and you're like, well, I could see this character going either of these two directions. Um, but this is a lesson I learned actually in Servants of the Storm which you said you'd read, which is um, I, I very, very rarely get writer's block. And um, when I do, I've learned it usually means that I have to 
go somewhere quiet and look at the last scene that went, the last like big scene that happened and see if I messed up there. If maybe the character did what I wanted them to do instead of what they would do, or if they didn't make the right decision for, you know, the book or whatever. So like in service of the storm, I got this big writer's block. Um, when Debbie was in the cafe and saw what she thought was her friend Carly and in the original, she like sat at the table and had like a quiet mental breakdown. And then I kind of stopped and I didn't know what to do next. And then I realized that's not what she would do. That's what I would do. What she would do is get up and like chase that person into the depths of hell itself. And so like I had to go back and rewrite the scene. And once she just chased Carly, instead of sitting at a table hyperventilating, the whole book just went right back on track. So Rhett's kind of like a, a natural, you know, uh, maturation of that same sense where like he knows what he needs to do pretty immediately. And if he doesn't, he just kind of resorts to violence. So it's a lot easier than a level-headed character who considers all the options and and what would be good or what would be nice versus just uh, following dull animal instinct. (laughs) Well, what I love, though, about Rhett so much is that, yeah, he does, like, he will just wreck someone's face, but his heart is so huge and he loves so much that it's just like, I am just always rooting for him. He would like hate to hear you say that. Like, <laughs> I don't love anybody. I love my mule and that's it. <laughs> well, that's another thing too. So um, my my sister-in-law, she grew up taking care of horses and she, she still does a lot with horses. And when she talks about horses, there's this special kind of love in her in her voice when she's talking about horses that I totally I well I felt like I picked up on when with all the, you know, the horses and the shadow series. Oh yeah. Um, at the time when I was writing that, I had a horse named Polly, and uh, my my main kind of like stress relief and adventuring was going on trail rides through the North Georgia mountains um, a couple times every week. Um, so a lot of these books were kind of like cogitated on trail rides. Um, the whole character of Earl came because the girl I would ride with had this little miniature donkey named Earl that would go on rides with us, and he was just so cantankerous. And he, my horse, hated him so much, and like he would get in front of her and go purposefully slow she would pin her ears back and start stomping her feet. And I was like, Earl, you are such a little turd. And then I was like, oh, I'm totally putting you in a book. <laughs> That's awesome. And he tried to mount my leg one time. Like, I don't know what got him so feisty, but um, like we were just riding and he kept trying to mount my leg against the horse. <laughs> and she would like turn and try to kick him. And then he would come back and start like nibbling at me like, hey, baby. And I'm like, that is a boot and you're neutered. <laughs> That's so funny. I can't imagine that with a donkey. I've had a few few dogs try to take their pass at my leg, but a donkey. Oh yeah. Yeah. He did not he did not get anything good that day. <laughs> oh man. I think we have a, a zoo near us and there's a few donkeys and I feel like I could just spend all day staring at their ears. I want a donkey, so when I talk to them, their ears twitch. Yeah, oh no, they're they're super cute. Um but it's definitely a Definitely makes a trail ride interesting to have a free floating donkey that just like comes and goes as he pleases. Yeah. No, I mean, and I joke, I have my one dog, um, he's pretty stubborn. And when he's done walking or when he's just done with whatever, he just kind of lays down and he's done. And I joke that he's a donkey. Yeah. Yeah. They're stubborn and getting into everything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, that's donkiness. Um, so, did you spend uh, time then in, in, in the desert? Um, I, not as much time. I'm, I'm from Georgia. Um, but when I get to a different area, I do like to see however much I can of it. So, um, I did go on a press trip to San Antonio with their chamber of commerce when I was writing for Cool Mom Picks, And they took us around to, um, all of the points of interest, including several of the missions, um, which were kind of not, not in the desert, but in kind of the area where a lot of, uh, the shadow books take place kind of the, the prairie and the scrub brush. So I've kind of wandered around some of those places, but I haven't been into the uh, the harsh kind of orangey hills I write about, except uh, my uncle took me for a drive in Arizona. So yeah, I, I did a lot of like online research and kind of made stuff up, but uh, it's such a, an interesting area. And I, I just loved the idea of this, this the wildness of it and the lawless, well, the, the setting a story in a lawless place. It almost has like a, an epic fantasy or a medieval feel to it where, you know, you're not as constricted by, by laws and society as we are. Totally. Well, I really like that because I mean, in, in some ways it was, you know, urban fantasy ish because it, it took pla- it takes place in like a, a real world, but the Western and the desert, it, it also feels like, you know, total epic fantasy. 
Yeah, um, I'd heard I've heard it called urban fantasy before, and I was kind of interested. Um, and then someone finally pinned it down for me about why, which is like when they think of urban fantasy, it's where the the city or the setting is almost like a person, um, and how evocative it is, and how it's it's part of the story. And I feel like that's the maybe where we get the urban fantasy vibe is is like even if it isn't set in technically a city, um, the the area around it is is almost its own character and the character that it lends to like every scene and to everyone's feelings. Well, and I I do I just love the setting. I actually right now I'm playing with the idea of moving to Arizona. And I was, you know, it takes a lot of like lotion. I have never been as dry. (laughs) Really? That sounds amazing to me right now because this is winter in Seattle and I feel like I have mold growing on my uh, on me. (laughs) Okay, that's fair. Well, no, I went the first time I ever went to Phoenix for Phoenix Comic Con. Like I was like, oh, my God, my hair looks amazing. This place is so cool. And then like on day three, my face started peeling off like V and I was like, oh, my God, what is happening? Oh, man. So Now when I go, I take like careful unguents and oils. and I'm like, please don't peel off. Yeah, thanks for the tip. I will. (laughs) I smell like coconut. Ain't nothing wrong with that. It's true. <laughs> so Phasma kicked so much butt. I couldn't read that fast enough. And then I wanted to read it again because I read it so fast. That's awesome. I'm so glad. How was writing that? Um, you know, writing Star Wars books is um, a huge honor and, and a crazy ride. And it's so different from how all of my other books are kind of written um, you know, at, at home in the darkness shrouded from my keepers. Um, <laughs> that one was very... It's more controlled, and, and you know, I, I didn't come up with it all on my own. It was definitely a group effort in getting to work with uh, my Delray editors and with Story Group and that sort of thing. And it had to go back and forth with um, Ryan Johnson, too, to make sure that nothing interfered with um, The Last Jedi. And I got to go to San Francisco to the Lucasfilm campus and read the script in November 2016. So I had to keep that secret for 13 months. Wow. Um, <laughs> about what happened in the movie, so... Uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty incredible, um, but I had a lot of freedom, especially in Phasma's actual story. Uh, the parts of the First Order with Cardinal had a lot more scrutiny just because we had to get all of those kind of T's crossed and I's dotted. But once she was out on Parnassus, um, it was almost, I got to make up almost all of that whole story. Wow, that's awesome. I I love that whole adventure and... I would get the second I would be like, oh, okay, we're grooving. And then I'd be like, oh man, how are we going to get out of this? Excellent. That's exactly what we're going for. <laughs> Holding your feelings hostage as long as possible. All my feelings were, were, were held pretty tight. I loved it. And uh, what a huge bucket list item that must be to writing for okay. Star Wars. 100%. It was really amazing. And I, I loved, of all of the things I could have gotten to write, I feel like uh, Phasma was a really great fit for kind of my my bailiwick of writing dangerous women. Totally. Well, there is definitely um, some pieces of losing me at the moment. This the spy, Imarati. Yes, yes. She uh, sometimes her tood and her sass and the way she kind of talks. She reminded me a little bit of um, what I liked about Patsy from the hit series. Oh wow! Thank you. Which actually, I was just thinking about the hit series the other day because so we are our electric company has told us that we're getting these wireless readers now. Oh, goody! <laughs> yeah, and um, and yeah, and to not get one, you have to pay out the nose because they want everybody to have them. And the other day, my whole like little horseshoe of a street is filled up with like fifteen trucks of all different sizes with the utility company and i was just like valor (laughs) oh they're here and you're signing the paperwork whether you want to or not yep stay away from my dog yeah oh poor man (laughs) so well then then you knew how amazing porgs were um oh my god when everybody was was all like we don't want any more earwalks anybody who doesn't want any more Ewoks, that's like being like, I don't like cake. Cake is terrible. I don't like parties with teddy bears either. (laughs) Right? I know. I wish I could hang out with a crew of Ewoks. I'm totally pro Ewok. That was my entree into Star Wars. Like I knew Star Wars was around, but when um, Battle for Endor and the Ewok Adventure came out in like 83, that's what really hooked me. Because you're like, you're, I guess I was six or seven and you're this little girl and you get to stay up late and watch this movie about a little girl who ends up in a magical forest full of murder bears. And you're like, yeah, this is my story. <laughs> I am here for this. Totally. Well, my uh, my dad was a toy collector. 
Mm. And he'd go to all these different, you know, toy shows and get, and his focus was Star Wars toys more than anything else. And he had just the, these, um, like three or four of the Ewok village play sets. Oh, wow. That were, I never got it. Yeah. These were, I mean, I didn't play with them. I looked for, at them from afar, but they were just, yeah, something about Treehouse and Fuzzy Bears. It just really captures the imagination. Oh, yeah. No, I love the, the creatures have always been one of my favorite parts of Star Wars, which is why I try to, like, sneak new creatures into all of my Star Wars books and comics. Yeah, and you're you're pumping out Star Wars comics right now. Yeah, um, it's, it's so exciting to get to write for IDW, but um, at the time they needed someone to write uh, Rose and Page, and since I was one of the only... Um, like approved people who had read the last Jedi script I was one of the only people who knew who Rose and Page were. So um, I was really lucky to get to do that. Uh, Cause I mean, I, Rose is just the heart of what the resistance is about. And, and I love that we finally have someone who like, she's not a scion from a last generation. She's not a magical wizard. She's not super important. She's not a hotshot pilot. Like she is just your average person trying to do her job. And she just gets to become a hero through sheer force of will and self-sacrifice. I love her. I'm just really excited about, I love The Last Jedi, and I am so excited for the future. Uh, yeah, no, I'm all in 100%. It was it was amazing. And uh, I definitely have tuned off all hot takes. I even sometimes had people on Twitter being like, what do you think about this? I'm like, I think I'm not going to waste moments of my life reading that because I loved it. You can't change that. Yeah. <laughs> it was such a good story. So also, um, I am so excited for your new series with Kevin Hearn. Yay, Kill the Farm Boy. I and uh, I'm I'm guessing from seeing the cover and a little bit that I've read about it that it has it has a humor. Oh yeah, no, it's very um kind of you know Discworld Terry Pratchett Douglas items like uh, it's got that kind of humor nonsense because it's just the world is it's grim enough without going grim dark right now. So yeah, we went completely like that's awesome. How yeah, is so we've, um, the I guess the first book, Kill the Farm Boy, is out uh, July seventeenth. So the AREs are out of that one, and then we're finishing up the second book, which is No Country for Old Gnomes, right now. <laughs> That's a fun title. Yeah, Kevin came up with that. <laughs> how How is it writing with a with another like writing a book with another author? Um, my situation is so charmed that I feel kind of bad talking about it because I've heard horror stories about co-writing, but co-writing with Kevin, he's one of my best friends. It's basically us sitting there with drinks and a big cheese plate going, oh, you know, it'd be super funny, homie. Oh, that's genius. You know what else would be great? I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a delight. There's a lot of back and forth. Um, and, uh, it's really delightful. We both have, um, our, our skill sets seem to be very complimentary in that, you know, He's really good at, uh, you know, keeping track. Like he he drew the map for the the book that's going to be in the official book. Like Kevin just drew that. Oh wow! And you know, keeping track of where things are, which I'm terrible at, and like time frames, which I'm like, sure, they walked a thousand miles in three days. It's great. <laughs> um, and then you know, I I come in and add kind of like the the whimsy and 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 the dumb asides. And uh, so together, yeah, it seems to really be working out. And we enjoyed a lot. We. Um, Hello Farm Bar, we mostly did um, like on the internet figuring it out, but uh, No Country for Old Gnomes, we were in New Orleans for a conference called StoryCon. We went to Frenchman Street and just drank our way through the book. Oh, wow. That sounds fun. Yeah, so like there's a griffin in No Country for Old Gnomes that came from the hotel we were staying in and had griffins everywhere. And we're like, okay, this is a sign. We're going to put this griffin in the book, but she farts a lot. That's the oh. kind of books they are. That's awesome. Have a magical, beautiful creature. It has indigestion. Well, you know what? That's important. Indigestion yeah. is the thing. Even griffins get it. They do. <laughs> well, this is a bit of a of a, a cliche question, but I spend a lot of time thinking about having past conversations with myself, time travel in general. But is there something or a series of some things that, you know, that you know now that you would bestow upon uh, you know, the you that was, you know, just starting out? Um, I, I guess I'm one of those people who kind of assumes that since everything turned out okay in the end, I would just stick with things the way that they went. I, uh, I mean, I've, I've been really fortunate in that I've gotten to write the books that I wanted to write and, and most of them have found homes and, and done stuff like that. Um, you know, just as, and so far as I'm, I'm reaching my goals, I guess you would say. So I wouldn't say that I have any missteps. Um, and I'm with my same agent that I started with in 2010, um, Kate McKean at Howard Moorheim. 
So yeah, no, I feel like I've been very blessed and a lot of hustle um, and I'm getting to do lots of exciting things. So it's like, I, the only thing I would say is just, you know, stick with it. Um, there's, there are times when, you know, before you, before you have an agent where it just feels like you are, you can't figure out what you're doing wrong. You're getting all these rejections. You don't know if your books are good or not, or just not sellable or what you're doing wrong. You don't know if you should just quit. Um, for me, I almost took on a really predatory, terrible contract, um, that would have, you know, just bombed my career from the beginning. So yeah, vanity presses that disguise themselves as legit publishers are not a good deal. But yeah, I mean, I, I would just say, you know, keep at it, keep working hard, read yeah. the contracts closely. <laughs> yes. Yes. It is. It is a, a grind. I mean, that's kind of where I am now. I have a lot of projects coming to the head and I'm trying to get all my, my ducks in a row and yeah, I'm just trying to keep my head down and not be anxious, which is hard. Yeah, no, that's, that's, um, I do remember that anxiousness, especially when I was querying of like, you're like, well, at any moment, my life could change. Maybe I should just stay home and stare at my email all day. And you're like, no, that's not when life happens. <laughs> but I do like, this is one of the reasons I, I teach classes at Lit Reactor is because when I think back to like, what would be the number one thing that would have helped me those days would have been like, if someone had just looked at my first chapters or at my, um, well, actually I got a pretty good return on my, my queries. Like I'm, I'm okay writing, writing queries, but especially with my, my, my first two books I wrote, I would get you know, a a full manuscript request and then, you know, just get a blank, um, like a blanket rejection. So you don't know what you did wrong. Um, so I, I, in all my reactive classes, I always read the first chapter and try to help people get their first chapter where they need it to be. So it's like that, that's what would have helped me the most back then. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, actually for me too, that's like, those are the hardest rejections is the, the close ones, not the, like the right out of the gate, you know, ones it's, after a while, it's like, oh, you know, you, I, you start in your mind being like, oh, okay, this is, you know, this is going to work out. And then it doesn't quite. And it's like, oh, okay, just keep chugging. Yeah. Um, I, my first book was a garbage fire. It's so bad. I show it to my students. I show them my first chapter with what I would have said to myself then. Cause it's so bad. Um, but like that book, I think I got 57 rejections on it, but finally toward the end, I had two different agents tell me, hey, like, you clearly have writing chops. This book is not going to go anywhere. It's fatally flawed. Send us your next book. And it was like, once I heard that, I just was, I was like, okay, well, we're done here. And I trumped it and committed myself to the next book. But it's like, you know, I, I feel like without the, without somebody saying, you've got chops, do something else. I, I could have just run in circles forever trying to, you know, polish the turd that was the first book. That's interesting. Well, yeah, any any bit of feedback. And that's why like when I, I started, um, I just started working with editors and getting feedback and learning as you know, what I'm doing wrong or what I'm doing right. And other people's eyes, especially when you're still trying to figure stuff out seems to be pretty clutch. Sorry, I missed that because I can't find my dog. What? Okay, there he is. Sorry. Oh, oh this is okay. I went to sleep on the other side of the tree outside. And I was like, Oh, God, where did he go? <laughs> oh, no. In moments like that, like, kids too you can't spot them for just a second i swear like i can feel like the wrinkles like popping on my forehead it's like oh we're there's another one here got outside and alligator's gonna eat him oh. but he did no, he's asleep in the sun alligators yeah we moved to florida so now we're very well aware that there are alligators nearby i have ants that live in florida and i spent a lot of summers in florida and yeah alligators and and geckos just everywhere. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, we have the little annals. Um, like, when I walk out to get the mail, I see, like, 30 of them scrawling out of the way like they're terrified of me. It's very empowering. Awesome birds in Florida. Oh, my God, yes. Oh, the birds are amazing. I just learned last week, um, we see on top of some telephone poles or power poles, there are these platforms with these huge, messy nests. And I'd assumed it was, like, bald eagles or vultures or something, but the birds are black and white, and I found out they're ospreys. <gasps> So now I'm super jazzed and I'm like almost running off the road because I'm spotting ospreys. They're really interesting looking birds. And we have sandhill cranes and bald eagles and ibises everywhere. Florida is, is Jurassic Park, basically. That's awesome. No, I love I love birds. We have bald eagles here. And then right now we have a we have an owl that hangs out in our tree. Oh, nice. So I'll hear them at night and it's pretty cool. It's cool, though. This stuff gets into my books. Like, I know I already liked Alligators because Servants of the Storm, but um, I got to write an X-Files, uh, a couple of X-Files comics recently. And uh, it's for the X-Files case files that's coming out soon. And my story is called Florida Man. Oh, that's, yeah, I saw that. There's, and I, and the covers has an alligator on it. I'm like, yay, Florida. 
Now, um, comics, is that something that you wanted to get into for a while? Yeah, um, I guess, you know, my, my I wrote my first book in 2009, got an agent in 2010, sold a book in 2011, and it came out in 2012. So right around 2012 or 13, I started um, feeling that kind of uh, monster power of, well, I could do anything now. Um, so I started saying I wanted to write comics, but comics is a really hard um really hard industry to get into. Like if you want to get published, even if you have, you know, no credentials or brand or platform or anything, you can still, you know, send your book off to agents with slush, which is how I got found. There's a clear path and in comics as a writer, there is no clear path. Um, even for artists in comics, there are some clear paths. They're not fun, but they're clear. But for a writer, there's no real way to directly go into comics. So I kind of started saying in 2013, I think, that I wanted to try writing comics. And it was very kind in that um, Calamity John Morris and my friend Ken Lowry were like, oh, well, we're doing this um, anthology for Boo, or uh, for Monkey Brain called Boo. It's a Halloween anthology. You'd get six pages. Um, there's no pay. Um, you know, anything to write my first comic. So I wrote for Boo for, uh, I think, three years. Oh, wow. So like my first story was a horror story called The Infernal Gallop. And then I did like a little play on a uh, feminist clue called Clueless. And um, then the third one was an X Files one called X Files. Uh, so you can see a lot of themes in my work right there. Um, but uh, yeah, then I so that having just that little clutch on comics, I was able to get on some comics panels at the conferences that I go to because I guess there are so few women in comics. They're like, oh, you've written six pages for a free anthology. Join us. <laughs> Um, so I was on a, a comics panel at Gen Con um, that was called How to Write Comics for Women that went completely haywire. The Mary Sue covered it. Um, and the, the, like, the next day, an editor at Boom asked me if I wanted to pitch a comic. And so that got me Lady Castle and then Labyrinth and Adventure Time and Rick and Morty. And now IDW has got Star Wars Adventures, Star Wars Forces of Destiny, and now some X-Files. So like, I am, I am hungry for the comics and loving it. It's such a nice little sorbet between these like huge, monstrous, 100,000-word books. I bet. I bet. I used to think that short stories would be that, but there's they're something so themselves that even though they oh, are yeah. are a break from a bigger project, they're still very dense. Yeah, it's definitely feeling. an art form, and they're definitely a, a different skill set. Like Just because you can write a novel does not mean you can write a short story. It's true. It's a fun little puzzle, though. I've, I've been enjoying just kind of exploring that part of my brain. Yeah, when I first started um, querying, you know, at this part of the query, you're supposed to put in your credentials. And I was like, I don't have credentials. I'll just whip out some short stories and get some book sales or whatever. And like, I got a big pun of rejections. And I was like, you know what? We're going to put this to the side because it hurts. <laughs> so at least with queries, you can send out 50 queries at a time if you want to. But with short stories, you can only query one magazine or anthology at a time. They right. want exclusive submissions. So it's like, you know, queries, you're like, oh, I got one out, and one in, got one out, and one in. And then with uh, with short stories, you're like, sent one out, rejection. Sent one out, rejection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and it's like, you know, it can take like 60, 70 days for that rejection. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, it was painful. No, I thought the same thing. I was like, oh, yeah, I'll do some short stories. This will be easy. No, it wasn't. <laughs> I got, you know, I got intrigued by the challenge, but that's how I work. I mean... I, if somebody tells me no, or if I'm like really bad at something, I become just incredibly stubborn and kind of, you know, it's like my Rottweiler when there's like a little tiny piece of food between all the chairs, he will just will himself under the table. That's how stuff gets done. Yep. So, I mean, uh, so as far as upcoming or uh, forthcoming works, you've, you've got um, the X Files comic that you mentioned. Yep. And, uh, Kill the Farm Boy. Yeah. And Treason of Hawks. And what? And Treason of Hawks. Yeah, Treason of Hawks. Uh, I don't know if we have a firm release date on that yet, but it's usually October. And that's the last book in the Shadow series. Oh, man. I'm, uh, I'm going to be highly anticipating this. This is uh, one of my favorite series by, oh, wow. by a long shot. It's just, I mean, Western fantasy. Like, I mean, I, I grew up, one of my, I was like seven, and one of my favorite movies was Tombstone. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, I'll be your huckleberry is like what I was saying to like bullies on the schoolyard. Nice. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, the Shadow series is so awesome. Well, you know, it, it happened because um, I, I've i always liked Lonesome Dove. Like when the miniseries came out, my whole family watched it. And because I'd seen the miniseries, I had to go read the books. And I read all the Larry McMurtry books. 
Um, but I kind of had this like, you know, I want to rewatch some Lonesome Dove. And I went to watch it. And I was like, man, this world, like you can't live if you're a woman unless you're a whore or a martyr or crazy. Like those are the only three roles that you get. And I was like, I don't like that. And I'm going to change it. <laughs> what is a character that would have had the hardest time living in this world? And it was like, that's going to be my hero who's going to like destroy everyone. <laughs> Well, and some, I mean, uh, Winifred is just awesome, too. Oh, thanks. She was a surprise. She was not part of the original plan. I did not know she was going to happen. It's that kind of stuff that makes me, like, when you're writing, it's like you tap into this, like, superpower, this magical cloud of some kind. And it's like, you can, I love the surprises. Yeah, I feel like, um... I, what I didn't understand about writing before I'd ever written a book was that your subconscious is like your biggest best friend and it does so much work if you'll just back off and let it and let these wonderful things happen. But yeah, I didn't know like Rep and Dan were just writing, I guess it was Nettie at the time and Dan were writing along. And then I just had the instinct to have Rhett lean over and puke because he's like, he's an easy puker. He pukes easy. And then it was like, what if he puked on? And then it, like, he just puked on a coyote and it was like, well, there we go. <laughs> Had no idea until I was like writing that scene in the moment. I had no idea what was going to happen. Oh, wow. Oh, I love that. I love that. And then you're like, who would be the most annoying person to show up for both Rhett and Dan? Like every character that shows up, I'm like, either who would be the most annoying or, you know, in the, in the, in the way of Sam, like who would mess him up the most and make his life the hardest just because he couldn't think of anything else? So everyone he meets is annoying. Well, that really helps too. I mean, you have tension. You 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 have a lot of a lot of plot you can find. Yeah, I always try to like. I teach a lot of world building classes, and I'm always telling people like, your world needs to get in the way of your character. Like, it needs to actively actively impede them, and your other characters do too. Like, there's no story to like six people who all got along had an easy journey. Like, that's not a story. <laughs> I think that was my very very first thing that I finished. Like, I, I was like total vanilla. Everyone got along. It was terrible. I learned a lot about conflict after that. Yeah. <laughs> well, and like what you were to, what you were saying about the subconscious, that's something that over the last like year, I've really been trying to just because I get so focused on like my goals or my or the outcome that I think that I want that I'll end up just bulldogging. And I'm not letting that extra piece of my brain do the rest of the work. Yeah, um, we can get very um, hyped up as writers. We're just very, very anxious by nature, usually. And you keep thinking, I need to fix this. I need to find this out. I need to fix it. And then it comes down to like lots of times I just need to back off. Taking that step away, I'm getting better at it. But it's just so hard for me to to accept the fact that the best possible thing I can do is shut my computer and go outside and play with the dogs. Yeah, no, for me, it's always, um, I either need to get in the car with music on and drive around without anybody talking to me or sometimes get in the shower um, or just being near water helps a lot. But yeah, it's, you've got to have a way to um, turn your brain off just enough. Mm -hmm. Let it work. Um, or I'll also like, if I'm having a problem, I'll think about it right before I go to sleep. And lots of the time, you know, it's like my brain works at it like a tangled knot and by the morning I got it like more figured out. That's um, awesome. The Prince of the Storm actually it was the hardest edit I've ever done. Really? Yeah it, it's you know young adult books you normally have a longer lead time it, it's often like two years before they come out from when they get bought so mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot of times I had like six months to do this major edit but it was a really really big one. Um, basically the magic system and it didn't make sense and they didn't understand like all the hidden mechanisms. And they said, well, what you really need to do is write a world Bible that describes who these demons are, where they came from, what they want, how the magic works, how the, um, you know, just how it all works. Because right now it seems like you're just going, oh, you know, it'd be cool. You know, it'd be cool. You know, it'd be cool. <laughs> and uh, so i had been like fighting it and fighting it and I couldn't quite figure it out. And then when, when morning um, I had this dream about like, it was one of those dreams that made no sense. And then I woke up crying from it and I realized everything that had happened and that was wrong and how to fix it. And it was like the weirdest, most, it's basically my subconscious was like, look, dummy, I've been trying to tell you this and you won't listen. Now I'm going to force you to experience it and then you're going to fix it. And like I woke up, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I fixed it. And like, you know, it had taken me six months and then two weeks I fixed it and sent it in and it was fine. Oh, wow. Major struggle. <laughs> 
Servants of the Storm is just one of my favorite books by you. Demons <laughs> and friendship. It works. Demons and friendship. And the whole thing was inspired by um, a series of photographs I saw on Tumblr of uh, Six Flags New Orleans after Katrina. And I was like, I have to write a book that has a destroyed, flooded amusement park in it because it's so terrifying. Isn't that funny how just the smallest spark can can trigger just a, a giant project? Yeah, it's, it's um, I wish that there was a way to read to like take in interesting articles on the internet without having to get furious at my relatives on Facebook. But I, I kind of miss that I could just scroll through Tumblr and see cool stuff back then. Yeah, well, I, I <laughs> Pinterest is kind of I have I only follow like fantasy art and puppy pictures. And yeah just go in there and I can scroll with, without all the, the crazy, the craziness that has taken over feeds. Yeah. It's, it's, um, I guess I, I probably use Instagram more for that these days, but I don't know. It's, uh, an Ars Technica helps a lot and Atlas Obscura, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I, and, and I'll get little ideas that run all around too. Um, I remember wanting to do something about the radium girls, but, uh, I think, Brooke Bolander beat me to that with the only harmless great thing where it's like, nope, I can't do anything that good. We're done. <laughs> There's so many interesting seeds out there waiting. And like, as far as managing those seeds, do you just, you know, it's, it's the ones that do you fall into the philosophy? Do you write a lot of things down that you think of, or do you kind of hold on to them and wait until they, they really bug you? Um, I, I write down certain things. Um, but for the most part, I've learned over the years, like the, the ideas that are sticky enough to get there stick with me and bother me. Like you said, I mean, it's like having a thorn in your foot uh, where you can't ignore them. Um, when I was first starting to write and I still thought that ideas were the hard part, I had little notebooks by the side of the bed where I'd write little tidbits of things or ideas I'd had. And I never mined them for information a single time <laughs> and never went back for them. I also used to, um, when I was still developing my process, I would, you know, whenever I had to delete large chunks or kill darlings or, or take out any words, I would have another document that I would plop them into. So I'd cut and paste. So it felt like nothing was ever wasted and I could go back and get it if I needed it. And like after three or four books, I realized I had never gone back to an earlier draft or a chunk at a single time. Like anything that I had said, I had said it better the second time around. And then I was like, okay, we're just done keeping these logs. Yeah, I think there's like a, I'm remembering a Stephen King tweet or quote or something about how he says like he doesn't write anything down until it you know his fingers are on fire or something. Yeah, well, that's um, another thing that I've realized is I'm not ready to write the book until I know the beginning, instigating factor, the main conflict, the climax, and the ending, um, as well as the the main character and at least. Uh, another main one or two characters. Anytime I've tried to write a book before I know those things, it just peters out with me trying to figure out what's going on. It's like I, I come up with a lot of my stuff organically and leave a lot of space in the in the process for you know people to vomit on coyotes or whatever. But <laughs> I, I've got to have that structure. Um, I realize it's a lot like you know going on a trip. Like you don't leave the house going, well, I'll go somewhere. You leave the house going, I'm going to the Grand Canyon. These are the main roads I'm going to take, but I could stop anywhere in between and have any kind of adventures. But it's like, if you don't know where you're going. You just kind of wander around going, well, should we do that or that or that or that? And then that's like, that just kills the momentum. I mean, I've, I've done that too, as far as like, you know, playing around with outlining, you know, there's all different, you know, all different ways to outline. And for me, it, it's similar. It's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a map, but it's not, I've killed my, creativity before trying to map everything out ahead of time and then realized halfway through banging my head against the wall that this part doesn't make any sense because it doesn't match this character at all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's definitely a, an interesting balance in the process. Well, in general, right. It's uh, everything seems to be some sort of balance act or another. Yeah. Well, uh, Delilah, can you tell, um, the listeners, how um, where they can find you on the on the internet? Sure, um, my website is whimsydark.com. dot com. Um, I'm on Twitter a lot at Delilah S Dawson, and I'm pretty much at Delilah S Dawson everywhere. Um, Facebook, which I don't do anymore because we all know that Facebook doesn't work. Um, <laughs> Instagram and uh, even Spotify. I always write to playlists, so if you like one of my books and you go to you know my Spotify. Uh, profile for at Delilah S. Dawson, you can see all of the playlists for every book I've ever written. Oh, that's so cool. I didn't know that. I love Spotify. 
Yeah, no, that's a big part of my process. Um, when I get that little story idea, like we were talking about, I start uh, building a playlist of songs that, that kind of sound and feel like the idea. And then I listen to it while I'm driving around and cleaning the house. And that's how I kind of get conditioned to get in that world. So that way, whenever I need to work on the book, like I, I have to switch between projects a lot. So if I need to get back in the groove, I can just put on that playlist and then I'm right back in that world. That's awesome. Yeah, actually, I, I, I do the same thing. It's like a key through the door that you need. Yeah, definitely. But Delilah, thanks so much for coming on the show. I had a lot of fun talking to you. Thank you so much for having me. It was great. And, and we didn't lose my dog, so that was excellent. Yes, I'm glad we didn't. We need our dogs. Yes. All right, that wraps it up for the week. You rock for tuning in. Follow me on Twitter at me bettingfield. The show at Too Many Words Pod. Instagram, Jamie the Scribbler. Drop by the site, tmwpod.com. And, of course, patreon.com slash too many words and show your support. I'll talk to you next week with YA author Jamie Quetzel. Over and out. Mm-hmm.